Revelation 13. Revelation 13, we're talking today, uh, Beasts of Blasphemy. Beasts of Blasphemy. I'll begin by reading the whole chapter. Revelation 13. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. And I saw one of the heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wandered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? who is able to make war with him. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds, and tongues, and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, threescore, and six. Now as we begin reading through Revelation chapter 13, I'm sure it's very familiar to many of us. Uh, we've probably read these words. We've probably also seen reference to that number, 600, three score and six, the 666, that, that number of the beast often associated with Satanism and, and devil worship and that sort of thing. And it's a very real, very, very biblical thing that draws our attention to it when God says, here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count that number. In other words, take account of it, make note of it. See that number. When, when, when you see it somewhere, you should, you should turn an eye. You should, you should wonder about that thing. And why is that number there? Well, it's there for a specific purpose, and we'll see that as it plays out in the, in the Scriptures and in these last days. Now, this beast, I believe, is a comparison of what you find in the previous chapter in Revelation 12 and verse one. Now it says over there, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven. And now here we are in, verse, in chapter 13, and it says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and we see later that that beast comes out of the earth. So here's the contrast that's being made, and I talked about Revelation 12 a lot, being a spiritual book, talking about spiritual perspectives. We see them play out and act out differently on earth, but we know for sure that there is wars in heaven, there is a heavenly kingdom, there is a whole world up there that is beyond our frame of existence, and yet, what happens up there happens here. And that's why we pray, as it is in heaven, so let it be on earth, when we're uh, following the Lord after prayer. Now this beast, it says, has seven heads and ten Horns. Contrast that to the dragon in the previous chapter also has seven heads and ten horns. 
the main difference that you'll find is with the dragon in chapter 12, right, being the spiritual of what's going on on earth, the crowns are on the heads. Now we find that in the case of the beast in chapter 13, the crowns are 10 and they're on the horns, every horn receiving a crown. The heads now in earth upon the sand of the sea and from the perspective of the earth has the names of blasphemy upon this head. So this is what we see when that beast is being described to us. Seven heads with the names of blasphemy, ten horns with ten crowns upon it. Now, people will go and they'll get all sorts of spiritual significance and understand it. They'll go to different sources. They'll go to places in the Bible and pull things out. They'll start saying that, oh, this is these ten kingdoms of the world because, you know, the Bilderbergers have divided it up to be so. I don't know that it's not in the Bible, so we can kind of leave that thing alone as Brother Rob was highlighting to me. A lot of these things we're not going to understand until we look back, and we discussed that yesterday, right? We'll look at things maybe one year, two years, three years from now, and we'll go, oh, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. That's why there are these seven heads and these ten horns. But look at this and, and take note of these things because they'll be important in the days to come. Now, this dragon, I believe, that we're seeing is manifested as a man, though he's described in this way. The dragon above is manifesting here on earth as a man, what it was spiritually up there. Now, that's a little confusing how I just said it, but if you go to Ezekiel chapter 28, I think it'll make a little bit more sense. Keep your finger in Revelation 13, and Ezekiel 28 gives us um, a description of what I'm describing. Remember, chapter 12 has the spiritual version of what's happening, and chapter 13 is indicating the same thing, the same beast, the same um, type of activity, except how it is manifest upon earth. Ezekiel 28, I'll begin reading in verse 1. Ezekiel 28, it says, The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God. Thou shalt not set thine heart as the heart of God. And so we see that pride is nothing new. Here Ezekiel's prophesying to the prince of Tyrus, and he's telling him, hey, you've set yourself as God, but you're no God. You're a man, though you've given yourself in your own mind the heart of a God. Verse 3 says, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and with thy understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches and hast gotten gold and silver in thy treasures. He has great wealth here. By thy great wisdom, verse 5, by thy traffic thou hast increased thy riches, and thine heart is lifted up because of thine riches. Right? That's the root of all evil, being money. Verse 6, it says, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, you've lifted yourself up with pride. Behold, therefore I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness. They shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the sea. Wilt thou then say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? But thou shalt be a man and no God in the hand of him that slayeth thee. We'll leave it there. There's the example of a man that sets himself as God, but very clearly as a man. He says, in the hand of him that slayeth thee, you should be a man, nothing more. You're mortal. You'll fall. You'll turn to dust like the rest of them. Now look down in verse 11. It says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now is this just describing the prince and the leader over him being the king supreme here on earth? Well, I don't think it can be, because if you look at verse 13, it says, Thou hast been in Eden. Okay, so that's very far away, historically speaking, from the Garden of Eden to when Ezekiel here is preaching. Ezekiel was at the latter portion of the captivity of 70 years when Israel was taken away into Babylon. He spent most of his life there in Babylon, preaching unto the Babylonians in, a, in, in, in Babylon of his day. But here he says to the king of Tyrus, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, the gold, the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. 
Thou art the anointed cherub, that's an angelic being, that covereth. And I have sent thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and therefore thou hast sin. Therefore I will cast thee out as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. So we can leave that there for a minute. It's going to continue on and describe God destroying this anointed cherub in the last days of what I believe. And so if you go back to Revelation, that's what I mean when I'm saying in chapter 12, it's giving a picture of what we just read, being the king of Tyrus, being the king of last days Babylon, that, that beast that is in heaven. He is the angelic one manipulating, calling all the shots in the spiritual realm from the side, the standpoint of evil and darkness. And it's affecting what was revealed in Ezekiel as the prince of Tyrus, or the earthly manifestation, the earthly ruler, the earthly um, reigner, the one that is pushing the works of darkness from the standpoint of the earthly realm. So we go back and we see then in verse 2 of chapter 13, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet was as it were the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. So here it's described, the beast is, as like unto a leopard, feet as of a bear, mouth as of a lion. Now that doesn't mean that it's exactly so. It's just a simile or a likeness that's being given. And we've, we've seen that in Revelation throughout. Whenever it says as if it were or as of a, it's, it's describing it in a way that we can understand. And yet it's obviously a spiritual truth that's being beheld here. Okay? Now, if you were, if you could, go to Daniel in chapter 7. Okay? Keep your finger in Revelation chapter 13 and go to Daniel chapter 7. And you might want to leave a, a bookmark or something back there in, in those uh, minor prophets, or those major prophets, Daniel being one of them. So in Daniel chapter 7, I'm going to begin reading in verse 1 as you try to find it. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And I beheld another beast, a second, like to a bear. And it raised up itself on one side and had three ribs in its mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given unto it. So as you're reading down through that, you find each one of the uh, beasts that was mentioned in Revelation chapter 13 is called out here. Okay, So as you continue down, you'll find what's referred to as the fourth beast. Now, I believe everything previous the fourth beast is in history now. Okay, but now we have a fourth beast being referred to, and as you study prophecy, you'll find that number four, the fourth kingdom, the fourth beast, is brought to attention because that's, for whatever reason, the in, in God's time frame of things, the last day's kingdom that's being referred to, the last day's beast that's being referred to. And I'll explain that as I'll go on. So this fourth beast, it says in verse 7, we'll continue reading, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast... Dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Or if we remember, Revelation 13 refers specifically to that beast having ten horns. 
Ten horns with ten crowns upon it. Now, that word diverse, it says it was diverse from the beasts that were before it. Okay? There's a reason why I can say that it was before it on the time scale of things, right? So it was diverse. Now, diverse doesn't always mean different. In fact, when I studied it out, that's a secondary term for it. The secondary definition of diverse is different. So diverse actually indicates in the primary showing a great deal of variety. So it, it is various of these beasts, right? That shows a variety of these beasts. And so for that reason, I think we can take what we learn about in Revelation chapter 13 and see that this is that fourth beast with ten horns and with a variety of the beasts that are before it. In other words, bits and pieces of it. And that's why, so when we look at the scriptures, it says he was like unto a leopard, like unto a bear, like unto a lion. Because he's taken traits of all of what's before him. These are kingdoms, I believe. These are kingdoms and men that lead over the kingdoms which is being referred to. With the variety of traits and law is what I believe this fourth beast takes upon. Now, another way that you can see that, you can hold your place there, I think, and go to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 de describes... All of the history of mankind as it's revealed unto Nebuchadnezzar in a dream and interpreted by Daniel the prophet. And in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 40, he started with the first one. And it says there in, uh, I don't know where it is, but he said, there it is. Verse 37, thou, O king, art the king of kings for the Lord, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom and power and strength and glory. And so he describes him as being the head of that great image. And it starts with gold, and then it's silver, and then it's bronze. And then at the bottom, if you read in verse 40, it says, And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it at the, of the strength of iron, for as much as thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay. And the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with miry clay. So partly strong and partly broken. What I believe that's describing is, and it talks about they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, is that that last day's kingdom is going to be part of spiritual and part of temporal. And essentially things are going to be busted open, and we're going to see manifestations of the spiritual realm upon earth as far as people getting demonically possessed and people be, you know, being manipulated visually by these beasts. There's going to be all sorts of interesting and crazy things happening in these last days. It'll be partly strong and partly broken. And this world is broken, okay? And so that's why I believe that the strength is coming from the spiritual side of things. And that will manifest itself a little bit further. So all that to say this, like unto a leopard, like unto a bear, like unto a lion, is that fourth beast described in Daniel chapter 7 and also referred to in Revelation chapter 13 as a last day's beast, which is part of and leader of and head of that fourth kingdom, which is partly strong, partly broken iron mixed with miry clay. Okay, I'm trying to let this flow out a little bit. It's a little bit confusing, I think, the first time, but study it out. Make notes if you have to, okay? Now, in Daniel chapter 7, again, we're going to continue reading and find out more about this beast, this fourth beast. It says in verse 8, I considered the horns, those ten horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom... There was three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of men, and a mouth speaking great things. So grab a hold of that phrase, a mouth speaking great things, because that's going to carry us through prophecy. Just like when you look at the uh, sun and moon being darkened, when you grab a hold of that phrase in prophecy, it's going to give you time frames. This mouth speaking great things will also connect a person as we study the scriptures out. Okay, so in verse 11, it continues down, and of this little horn, it says, I beheld then because of the voice of the great words 
which the horn spake. And the Bible describes the last days. There is going to be a deception, a lie that's believed, that if it were possible, it shall deceive the very elect. And so here we find Daniel. He says, I beheld the words. I beheld them because of the great voice of these words which the horn spake. In other words, he seems to be indicating he's drawn into these words. They're, they're smooth words. They're something that is, is subtly drawing in even a great man of God like Daniel at this time. Now after that, you can find in verse 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like unto the Son of Man, glory to God, came with the clouds. So we know what that is, correct? We know that that's the return of Jesus Christ. One like unto the Son of Man, coming in the clouds, and catching up his elect from one end of heaven unto the other at this time. Okay, so as we continue down, keep in mind, and also keep a finger there in Daniel chapter 7, and go back to Revelation chapter 13. So in Revelation chapter 13, I'm going to begin reading in verse 3. Revelation 13 and verse 3, it says, And I saw one of the heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wandered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And so there we see that phrase, mouth speaking great things, mouth speaking great things, drawing that little horn from Daniel chapter 7 into the context of Revelation chapter 13 here. Okay, so there we have in verse 3, one head, as it were wounded to death. And now all the world is wandering, even as back in Daniel when he said, I behold then because of this great orator, these great words that came out of his mouth. Now in verse 4, his words are so powerful, and amen, words are powerful, are they not? Especially in the hands of a, of a Christian soldier, that, that word of God. But words in this world are powerful too. God chose words to empower and to draw in his people. You don't think the devil's got a substitute for that? Words are going to be what allures people. And here we find the whole world is caused to worship there in verse 4 and adore this beast because of those great powerful words and that mouth speaking great things in verse 5. Now, we find in verse 6 the obvious and clear anti-God and anti-Christ bias that this beast has. He opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Okay, so here he's just he's just basically blaspheming and talking down to and, and speaking evil of the people of God and God himself and God's tabernacle, everything that is holy and righteous. So keep your finger in Revelation chapter 13. I'm going to go to Daniel chapter 8 now. Daniel chapter 8. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. And in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in a vision and was by the river of Ulai. Then I lifted up my eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns, and one of the horns was high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. So this is an introduction. I want you to go back and read that in your own time. Basically what he's going to describe is these two rams are coming together in this battle, and glory to God, later on he's going to explain exactly what it means. Because when you're kind of reading this, you're like, okay, this ram's horn's moving and this is pushing. It's the other one from the east and from the west. It's a little bit difficult to follow. But that's all an introduction to what I want to get to in verse 9, okay? In verse 9. Again, I'm thinking everything before that in verse 8 is happening previous to the time where we're sitting now. So in verse 9, here's that little horn again. It says, and out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the hosts of the stars to the ground. 
and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. So here, if you remember... In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 8, it talks about the beginnings of sorrows. So here's our timeline. We have the beginnings of sorrows, and then we have the abomination of desolation, and then we have the great tribulation, and then we have the Son of Man coming into the clouds. Now, is this it? Is this, is this the, the end of all things? Is this what's being described here as that, that abomination of desolation? Well, look what the question is posed in verse 13. It says, Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto the certain saints which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. In other words, how long shall the Gentiles tread underfoot? How long shall that abomination of desolation be there? Now it says the transgression of desolation. It talks about the daily sacrifice being removed. I believe those are part and parcel, the same thing. And that's the same phraseology, a little bit different wording as when he says, when that abomination of desolation spoken of Daniel by the prophet shall stand in the holy place, then flee, right? That's the charge in Matthew chapter 24. And so I'm glad that this saint asked the other saint a question here because it gives us clarity. He asked, how long shall this be? What does it mean? Well, Daniel was confused about this thing too, right? And it said in verse 15, and it came to pass... When I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. Verse 14, it was revealed to him that unto 2,300 days until the sanctuary shall be cleansed. In other words, until the abomination time frame is fulfilled. That's, that's your three and a half years, that if you look and study that out time frame wise in scriptures. Now, what does it all mean? Daniel's confused. He says in verse 16, And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. Verse 19, it continues, and Gabriel starts to explain to him exactly what the vision of the rams fighting against one another, moving with collar one toward another, and that battle that took place. Verse 19, it says, And he said, Behold, I will make thee to know, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. The ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. There it is. Does Media and Persia exist today? No, they do not. That's a past kingdom and a battle that took place. Verse 21 says, And the rough goat is the king of Gratia, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. I believe many liken that unto Alexander the Great as he came in and conquered these nations, right? Now that being broken, verse 22, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. And history will tell us that, you know, Daniel the Great died at a young age and then four kingdoms broke apart. His kingdom broke into four and continued in that manner. Not under his power, but each one under their own power they eventually came to. Now these are world events that are preceding the day that we live in. These are a long time ago, Media and Persia and Gratia coming in and then that busting open into the, the four kingdoms. That's what's being described here. But look down in verse 23. Gabriel's going to get more clear. He says, and in the latter time of their kingdom, meaning that that same kingdom exists in part today. In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to a full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. Now that king of fierce countenance, what does that mean? He's got a fierceness to his appearance, his visage. He looks fierce. Now, if anybody's seen him, think of Kenneth Copeland. Who looks more fierce and, and wicked than a guy like that, that false prophet, right? There's a fierceness to that countenance. There's an, you can look at somebody like that and just be like, man, that guy is demon-possessed to the toenails, right? You just look and you're like, wow, what in the world is wrong with that thing? 
Okay, something like that, I believe, is going to be the king of fierce countenance that understandeth dark sentences. That's that's perhaps dark arts, dark uh, magic, that kind of um, power given unto him. And, and he understands these things, and he shall stand up. Verse 24 says, And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. What does that mean? His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and holy people. Now, what is that power that is not his own? I believe that's the demon possession. As they said, the fierce countenance comes upon him. He's given dark sentences, dark powers, and an understanding of those things. Spiritual powers upon a man, I believe, is what's going to happen in the last days. His power was not his own. He was possessed of a devil, perhaps the devil, as he's being referred to here. Nevertheless, this could be the same one that had that deadly wound and was healed. In verse 25, it continues, through policy, through his policy also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He also shall stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. And so this is a political foe, I believe. Through his policy shall he cause craft to prosper. Which craft? The last days, I think a lot of people are shying away from the fact, but, but Catholicism is mostly full of witchcraft. And, and what else? The New Age movement is witchcraft at its core. Uh, all of these other mystical religions that come from the Far East are just full of witchcraft. In other words, you say the right words and things will happen. You, you do the right things and blessings will come. That's work religion in a nutshell. When one stands up and through his policy makes craft to prosper, makes that kind of darkness and those those evil spirit workings um, basically popular. He magnifies himself in the heart, and by peace he destroys many. Think about a world where everybody thinks that, that playing around with crystals is good and, and using enchantments is good. Craft is prospering in these last days, and many are destroyed thereby. He even stands up and says, against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Of course, if you stand up against the prince of princes, that shall be so. Now, he continues on, and Daniel, in the end of the vision, he faints, he rises up, and he just doesn't understand the vision at all. Things that are happening here in Daniel's day, when he, think about it, he's looking into our day. I mean, can you imagine, think of even your grandparents, you know, if they didn't grow up into it, if they would just see, like, the device, you know, just see something like that, it's just like, whoa, that's magic, that's the future, what is this? He doesn't understand what's going on here, and yet he was used to, to pen it and to record it. Now, it describes there that the holy people will be destroyed at this time. So if you go back to Revelation chapter 13, and in verse 7, we would expect to find that same thing. Because we're following a certain beast. I liken him unto that little horn because of the character traits that he embodies. And there it is in verse 7. It was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So he's given over, given power over all of these mighty nations and these mighty people. It says that he overcomes all of these kingdoms and all of these people. Back in Daniel, it talks about the holy people being destroyed and also the mighty being destroyed. Verse 8, it says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And I believe that excludes those that that would chose not to. There's going to be two full people being destroyed. There's going to be the mighty being destroyed. There's also going to be the, the holy people of God that are destroyed at these days. And I think you can kind of see it when you start to see celebrities putting on these little shows and these these uh, one world shows. You know, they're almost jockeying for position because the reality is in these last days, the, the devil hates even them. Even the powers that be in this world that are coming against us, the devil hates them too, and he wants them dead. And so there's going to be a calling of God's people, but also the mighty at this time. He's not going to be picky and choosy, but these are probably vying for positions. They're trying to be one of the chosen ones that gets to go on into this satanic kingdom that God, or the devil, God's allowing the devil to, to set up here. So the mighty and the people of 
God here are being destroyed. And it says that all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And praise God, my name is written there, so I will not be worshiping, right? This is what is the indication here. If any man, verse 9, have an ear, let him hear. Okay, so that's the same phrase, similar phrase that's used in Matthew chapter 24, after the abomination of desolation. When you see that abomination of desolation, what Daniel the prophet spake of, which he prophesied of, he says, whoso readeth, let him understand. In other words, if you got ears to hear, hear this. If you're reading this, understand it. This is important stuff. This, is, this abomination of desolation is pivotal to everything that's going on here. You hear it, you read it, understand this thing. Hear it and, and, and behold this thing. Let him hear that. Let him regard that. Verse 10, and this is what I meant when I was talking about how, how, how the great and mighty are eventually going to fall. It says, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. And so the captives, the captors always become captives. There's that, there's that saying that happened, and in, in, it was written as a poem in, in World War II in Nazi Germany. It says, when they came for the communists, I didn't say anything because I wasn't a communist. When they came for the trade unionists, I didn't say anything because I wasn't a trade unionist. When they came for the Jews, I didn't say anything because I wasn't a Jew. When they came for me, there was no one to speak for me. Okay? This is how it works. It comes in stages. It flows out like... Little by little by little by little. They're going to come for a group, and then they're going to use the group that came for them to have someone else come for them, to have someone else come for them, to have someone else come for them. I saw a picture of, of the, um, you know, like a, a, a scene in a, a church, and there's somebody sitting in a pew, and someone behind them has a gun to their head. And it was the people, and then it was the police or the government. And then it shows behind him there's somebody with a sniper rifle, and that's the government, right? Or that's, that's the, those, the powers that are up beyond them. Everybody's got a gun to the head of the people beneath them. It's essentially what's going to happen in these last days. And the Bible describes very clearly that if you're leading people into captivity, you're going there. In other words, those politicians that are pushing the policies of the beast, they're eventually going to fall to those same policies. The policemen that are forcing the policies of the beast are going to be taken by those same policies. Those rats that we have in the windows spying on people and, and calling the police on their neighbors, they're eventually going to fall to their own tattling. And they're going to be taken out by the beast. He's not distinguishing. He doesn't care. He wants everybody dead. Man, woman, child, young and old, saved, not saved. He hates men. That's his beef, okay? Satan wants everybody to die. None to come to repentance. He wants the whole world of humans to be destroyed. So, if we go into captivity, at least take some consolation. The ones that take you there are next, okay? <laughs> this is the thing that people don't understand. Whenever you're used as a puppet, somebody else is pulling that puppet's strings. And continues on. And on and on. And that's the promise. If you look in Matthew chapter 24, it indicates this. Revelation 13, keep your finger there. Matthew chapter 24. We can go there and you can keep a bookmark there. But in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 8, it says, All these are the beginnings of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved from this destruction that's being described. But look at this. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached unto all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall that end come. That gives you marching orders for what our last day's duties are, doesn't it? Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. There's going to be people betraying brothers and sisters unto the death. There's going to be uh, hatred within what used to be called love. There's going to be false prophets rising, deceiving many, and iniquity waxing cold. And our job is to take that gospel and preach it to all the nations. Amen. Then shall that end come. Okay? So there's our marching orders at these days. And this is what I've always pictured, and my wife and I have talked about this in description of the last days, is that we're marching forward with a Bible in hand, preaching the gospel as there's bombs and guns going off everywhere. We're seeing, we're seeing hell on earth. We're seeing iniquity abound. We're seeing rioting. And we're standing on a street corner and saying, Repent and believe the gospel. It's faith alone. In Christ alone. 
right? That's the last days, Christian, okay? We're not hiding away, sheltering in place. Throw that new Canadian flag in the garbage. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah. You replace the leaf yeah. with a house. <laughs> Bunch of clowns. <clears throat> so that's describing, and what we're seeing in Revelation chapter 13, I, I believe is about verse 8 here in Matthew 24, down unto the events that happen in verse 29. So we see the beginnings of sorrows. Then in verse 15, we see the abomination of desolation. Then in verse 21, we see then shall be great tribulation. And then finally, glory to God, immediately after that tribulation, the sun and moon shall be darkened. And then shall we see the sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. Okay? This is how things are playing out. And this is a bit of what we're starting to see transferring as we go through Revelation chapter 13. So back there in Revelation 13, so far I believe basically the hearts of the world have been won. That little horn with that great mouth is bringing policy. He's bringing laws. He's bringing um, just, just standards of living. He's changing and seeking to change times and seasons. He, he's a political figure, I believe. He's governmental. He's political. He's, he, the Bible records that he was that, that beast that was given by the dragon in verse 2, his power and his seat and his great authority. So we think of the rulers as having a seat. In, right, in, in, in leadership. And we have, they have power, they have authority, and that's what that first beast, that little horn, I believe, possesses. Now, verse 11 continues, and we're going to learn about the other beast. And it says it very clearly, verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, but he spake as a dragon. So he's like a lamb. Jesus is that lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He is the lamb of God. But this is like a lamb, yet he speaks as a dragon. Christians ought to get to know the voice of the shepherd because there's going to be one that looks just like the shepherd. He's as a lamb, and yet his words will betray him. He speaks as a stranger speaks. He speaks as the devil speaks. He speaks as the dragon, that old serpent, that devil that Satan, he, he speaks as that anointed cherub that covereth, that fell from heaven, was rejected because he sinned. But he's going to appear as a lamb. And actually, most of the world is going to say, is this not he? Behold, here is Christ in there. Right? Believe it not. Right? Because there's going to be many false Christs. And this one will stand up. And in all the power given him by the dragon, by the devil himself, he will go forward and, and, and carry out his devious and dark in dark desires. Verse 12 it says, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast. So he's taking the power that by, by, by policy was given unto him. By, by craft was given unto him. In other words, he's been given as this spiritual leader is what I think it is. Right, The government side's taken care of. Perhaps now there's only one, gov one, one religion allowed and this beast is the leader of it. Looks as a lamb, spake as a dragon. Antichrist, ring a bell. He's given all the power that is given him by that devil beast before. That little horn. And he exerciseth it. And he causes the earth and then that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He exercises this power and the first thing he does when he gets it is he points to that first beast. Now, how is he going to win the religious hearts? How is he going to convince Muslims to shake hands with Jews, to shake hands with Catholics, to shake hands with Baptists? Yeah. How is he going to cause every religion in the world to unite under one banner? Verse 13. He doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire to come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. How fickle. Someone shows up and makes fire come down. And the whole world will wander after this beast. Verse 14, And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, and that which had the wound by the sword and did live. So the power of these miracles, 
That great, the great thrust of, of fire coming down in the sight of men is going to convince people he is that true God. He is that true spiritual leader. He's the one that we should be following. And he takes that power that was given unto him and points all the adoration to that first beast which had the wound and did live. Now remember, it talks about that, how out of three, one little horn rises up. And it describes that previous, that there is one horn there that has a head, as it were, wounded to death. That deadly wound was healed. That's connecting to the one that they're wandering after, they're praying after, they're seeking after. I believe there was some sort of death, burial, and resurrection that took place here. I believe that there was a wound to the head that everyone was like, wow, he's dead. And yet, after a time, that wound was healed. And this is probably what takes place when, I mean, the devil can't bring life to, he can't create life. He can't bring someone back from the dead. But he could probably possess somebody. He could probably take a frame and embody it and use it. You know, through technology that we have these days, somehow they make that the deadly wound is healed and that beast walks again. That little horn walks again, talks again. And that's what happens as we continue down. His image, it says in verse 14, the second half of that, the, the, the beast that's pointing to the first beast, he says to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by the sword and did live. And here it is. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And so there's some sort of image that is given life, and it's enough to convince everybody that this is the God. This is, this is the one that we should be worshiped. This is the truth. This is, this is our leader. This is where we should put all of our love. He's, we need to follow after him, a living image. And the charge is made in verse 15. He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as that would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And so it comes with worship, what's going to happen afterwards. Worship is the first step of what's going to happen at the end of this chapter. You must worship the beast and the image or die. As many as would not worship, die. So this is a worldwide call to worshiping a devil. That's what's taking place here. What happens after that? Of course, we know back in verse 8 that the ones that have their name written down in the book of the Lamb, of the Lamb's book of life, that was slain from the foundation, they're not going to worship him. But they're certainly going to be prompted to. They're certainly going to be tempted to. They're certainly going to be challenged to. They're certainly going to be almost forced to up to the very end, last moment, martyred for their stand against what's about to happen, the worship of a false god. If there's ever a time to stand, I believe it's now, but hey, you know, it's never too late to get into the Christian fight. So hopefully it's not so, but there's many Christians that will wait to that final moment where they'll choose to stand for Jesus Christ and not worship that beast and not worship that image and not receive what's about to come. It says in verse 17, And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So you have to worship, you have to receive a mark if you want to participate in society. And here we're seeing precursors to that, aren't we? You have to stand in line. You have to wear a mask. You have to da, 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 if you want to participate in society. More and more you're seeing the signs go up, hey, we don't want to accept cash. Use the use the use the tap, use the tap, use the tap. Right? If you want to participate in society. We got rules if you want to take part in what's going on here. We're progressing. There's a new normal happening. You want to join the new normal? Follow the new normal rules. That was that was JT, Justin Trudeau himself. There's a new normal with new rules, okay? It's, it's a precursor to what we're, we're seeing here, right? We haven't seen an image. We haven't seen an abomination of desolation. But, hey, prepare, right? I think Christians should be standing now against some of these things. I think we should be going, oh, I'm not doing that. People with a mask. We know they're, they're not good for you. There's Bible verses that say you should not cover your mouth, right? Unless you're sick, okay? So this number is given the number of his name the mark of the beast is associated with worship of the first beast that second beast is pointing to him doing miracles showing that he is this great spiritual leader that he makes himself to be and he points under that first beast he points under that image and if you don't worship it 
you're killed. If you don't take the mark, you can't participate. No man might buy or sell. So if he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding, and God's given us that spirit of understanding, count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is 600, three score and six. That's 666 in our vernacular, right? And so that's, that's the end game. That's going to be what basically divides the world from those that are going on to the new norm and those that refuse. Most will be killed at this time. I think, I think there's going to be a small, majority, a small minority that actually sees the coming of the Lord. Because this is going to be, this, this is going to be serious. This is going to be, this is going to be well planned. It's going to be well orchestrated. The technology is all there. It's all in line for the first time ever. No wonder Daniel didn't get it, right? For the first time ever, we're able to do all of the cashless society. We're able to do all of the tracking and tracing. We're doing, able to do all of the scanning. That's why they social distance you, right? Because even though even though their technology is advanced, it also kind of kind of stinks. You need to be a little bit far apart so that they can reach you properly. Right? If you've ever taken a try to take a picture of yourself and there's two of you there, that little thing, that box will go back and forth. It's freaking out. It doesn't know how to it doesn't know how to line to who. It doesn't know what to do with itself. That's why they social distance you because then their technology can pick up each one of your faces, recognize if you're disturbed, if you're perturbed. If, if you've got a disgruntled look on your face and as you're going to the store, maybe you're somebody that we need to get rid of. You should all be happy, you know, smiling, joyful. Ooh, that one's got a fever. Oh, he can't come into the store, right? So all of these things are in place. All of this technology exists. It, now we read something like this, and that's not even shocking, right? Do we not have these little chips that go ding, right? Oh man, this chip is so convenient. You lose it all the time. Hey, what if we just take one the size of a grain and just put it in your hand? You don't have a right hand? Put it in your forehead, sure. No big deal. Ding, to pay for your things, right? It's, it's not hard to see. It's not hard to imagine, as it was even 10 years ago. Okay? Go back to Matthew chapter 24, and I'll finish up. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 24. And we just saw the mark. We saw that image that was made that was given life when we were to all worship him. I believe that's the abomination of desolation, standing in the holy place of God, receiving worship as God deserves, okay? Verse 15, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. That's the time to hide. See, we're here in, in probably even a precursor to the beginning of sorrows. We're in the beginning of the beginning of sorrows, and a lot of Christians are hiding, scared, running scared, okay? But up to that time, you see the betrayal of loved ones. You see, you see the love of many waxing cold. You see iniquity abound. You see this world waxing worse and worse and worse in almost uh, like skyrocketing fashion at the beginning of sorrows. When that ends, right before the abomination of desolation is placed, that mark of the beast that comes by worshiping the image of the beast, once that's in place, right before that, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations, and then shall the end come. You can't run and hide until that point. Okay, when that transfers over, and he says, when ye shall therefore see the abomination spoken by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, stand where God deserves to stand, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No shall ever be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days should be shortened. The mercy of God steps in. As the world ramps up its control and tries to just cull off everybody that would name the name of Christ. Cull off anybody that would not bow to the image. God's mercy steps in. I believe the gospel will still be being preached, but now it's, it's real. Now you're underground. Now you're running. Now you're fleeing. Trying to get to what? Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun and moon is darkened. The moon doesn't give its light. 
Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds. And then look up for your redemption, draweth nigh. Then you can finally say, I've made it. I've finished the course. Whosoever shall uh, arrive, it says, it says the same shall be saved. He that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. That will be the salvation. That final salvation from the destruction of the flesh will be given to a few. Because this is describing a time of just chaos and just full-on vengeance coming from the devil and Satan and, and, and the, the hordes of this world coming upon God's chosen people, the believers. But God cares. Look at it. It says in verse 22, he's going to shorten those days. He's going to be merciful to others, not extend it as far as it would be. Verse 25, it says, Behold, I have told you before, none of you standing in this room now are ignorant of these things. And I know you've studied it out before and you've read these things. Behold, I have told you before, I'm going to shorten these days. You'll see these things coming. And he's ultimately coming for me. Coming for you. If you're alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, the gathering unto him, what a glorious day that will be. But we've got some work to do in the meantime. Amen. We have not seen what is portrayed in Revelation chapter 13 yet, but we can see it inching closer and closer and closer and closer. The stage is set, right? In heaven, there's great battles going on. They're starting to manifest down on this world. Eventually, there shall be time no more. All the horde of hell that's abiding in heaven will come down upon this earth. They'll know if he hath but a short time. And he's going to, to the fullness of his fury, come out at God's chosen people and through craft, deceive the world. And through, through his principles, through his... his uh, through his laws and through his, his, his other means that he has governmentally. He's going to bring in a time where it will be so hard to even get by in this world. And then shall come that great false prophet pointing to the beast, saying, worship him. He's dead. He's alive forevermore. They'll say, lo, here's Christ. we got to be preaching the gospel. <laughs> we gotta be, we got to be, we got to be, at the front lines. Just, just, and, and that's honestly, I believe that's where God's protection will be. The people that are hiding at the beginning of sorrows will not have God's protection, in my opinion. It's the people that are out there with the Bible in hand that will have God's protection, that will have even a hope of arriving at that last day. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, time shall be no more, and we go to meet him in the air. Right? Amen. Amen. That's good. That's good scripture there. Thank you, Father, for this day. I pray, God, that you would just uh, illuminate these things in our minds, Lord. Write them on our hearts. Uh, help us to all go home and study them out further. I know I have not exhausted that. I know that I do not have everything figured out. I enjoyed the time of study with you, Lord. And uh, I'm thankful for everything you were able to do through this sermon and through this ministry. God, continue to work in our hearts, Lord. Help us to be the soldiers for the Lord that we ought to be. Help us to get sin out of our life. Help us to live unto righteousness. Help us to seek you every day more and more and more. Help us to assemble so much the doors more as they see that day approaching. Stand up, God, for what you have commanded us to do. Do right. We'll thank you, God, for it. In Jesus' name, amen.